Warm welcome to you and over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Martin. Good evening, everybody. Um, okay, the Manchester Ship Canal. In order to understand how the Ship Canal came about, it's necessary to look briefly at the history of the rivers in this area and the events that led up to the building of the largest canal in Britain. This illustrated guide was published at intervals during the seven year construction of the, the canal. This issue was probably 1892 or maybe 93, but hey, apart from anything else, the adverts are really worth looking at. Uh, Thomas Steers, who was the engineer responsible for the Liverpool docks, drew this map of the Mersey and Irwell rivers, and it was he who carried out the improvements in the early 18th century, uh, which involved dredging and the building of locks and, um, and short cuts. Um, you can appreciate here the need for the butcher's field cut, which saved uh, over a mile of travel. Um, the problem is with a 35 mile long subject, it's difficult to portray it in one meaningful image. So I'll just move along a little bit and oh, there's another needed short, needed shortcut here at Sandy Warps. And a little further on, oh, would you remember Sticking's Lock? We'll see it again. Um, and so by 1734, ships of very of moderate size could reach Manchester. And in 1761, the first canal of the industrial age was built to link the Duke of Bridgewater's coal mines in Worsley to, with, with uh, Castlefield in Manchester. Uh, 15 years later, they extended the canal to Runcorn in direct competition to the Mersey and Irwell rivers. Um, here it is, the Bridgewater Canal, open to Manchester in 1761, crossing the River Irwell at Barton, where the arrow is, um, of course, using Brindley's brand new aqueduct. And then in 1776, it was linked through to the newly built Trent and Mersey Canal, with an arm to the port at Runcorn on the Mersey. In response, the Mersey and Irwell built the Latchford and Runcorn Canal in 1804 to protect their interests, but, but really it was too little, too late, because in 1844 the Bridgewater trustees bought the Mersey and Irwell on the principle of, uh, if you can't beat them, buy them, and within 30 years the Bridgewater Navigation Company was created. Okay, so that's the prehistory bit over. Um, in 1870, Manchester faced depression. It was a fact that half the cost of a ton of goods to India was dock charges and handling in Liverpool. It was cheaper, in fact, to send by rail to the East Coast and then ship out from Hull. Perhaps the Bridgewater Navigation Company was formed as a result of this. And in 1877, Mr. Hamilton Fulton proposed the brilliant idea of a tidal navigation all the way to Manchester. There was one minor problem. The docks would be at the bottom of a 60 foot hole. Hmm. Edward Leader Williams, who was a leading canal engineer, he came to the Bridgewater Navigation Company when it formed in 1872. And nine years later, he proposed that the canal uh, should be half tidal and half locked, but then later improved that to the canal, well, the one we know today. And on the 27th of June, 1882, Daniel Adamson con uh, convened a meeting at his home to which he invited 76 of the most influential and wealthy men of the region. A proposal was put and met with general enthusiasm. A committee was formed, which became the Manchester Ship Canal Company, with Adamson as their chairman. It was decided to obtain an Act of Parliament, and a bill was drawn up. But it proved difficult to get through Parliament. In 1883, the first bill was rejected in the Commons. 
The next year, the second was rejected by the Lords due to concern over damage to the estuary of the Mersey. It was the third bill which was successful. And um, after a decision to extend the canal along the coastline to Eastham, the company was tasked with raising seven million pounds. Now, Adamson was a good innovator, but he wasn't a financier. He resigned and he actually didn't live to see the completion of his canal. He died in January 1890, but he was succeeded by um, Lord Edgerton of Tatton. This gentleman who led the fundraising and it took two years. Oh, uh, and incidentally, and absolutely nothing to do with the ship canal. Edgerton's wife was Alice Anne Temple Nugent Bridges Chandos Grenville. <laughs> Signing checks and letters, I think, probably took an awfully long time. But anyway, back to the ship, ship canal and, and indeed talking of checks. One of the chapters in the Act stipulated that the Manchester Ship Canal Company had to buy the Bridgewater Canal and all its undertakings. The assessed value? £1,710,000. The cheque survives to this day. At the time, it was the largest cheque ever written. The value today, you'd have to multiply it by 100. 171 and a half million pounds. The total cost of the canal was estimated to be nine million. The actual cost was 15 and a half million. But I'm going to get on with the practical details. Um, at the opening ceremony on the 11th of November 1887, Lord Edgerton cut the first sod on the site of the lock at Eastham and hefted it into a barrow which Edward Leader Williams wheeled a short distance away. After the ceremony was over, the lump of earth was cut up and there was a scramble to obtain a piece of history. Thomas Andrew Walker was appointed the contractor of the, of the enterprise. He had plenty of experience with large civil engineering projects. He built the Metropolitan and District Railways in London and the Seven, seven uh, Railway Tunnel. He estimated that the canal would take four and a half years to build. It actually took six years. Canal building techniques had advanced considerably since the days of the original canal builders, who, um, here we are, each had a complete kit for digging a canal, a, sp uh, a spade, a barrow, and a plank. Mm. Now they had steam and railways. 700 men were employed initially, which grew steadily. Uh, as is, I think, obvious from this photograph, health and safety was still in its infancy. No barriers, no notices, no stripy tape. Um, Walker, the contractor, built towns for the workers. Admittedly, the conditions were a mite primitive as this was the main sewer. And child labour was an accepted practice. Uh, I wonder how old this one is. Mind you, his attitude does look fairly uncompromising. The canal was divided into eight sections here, separated by those red lines. Um, and all of them were worked on simultaneously with the exception of the first two that's on the, the left, those two there, they were built consecutively and it was required that either Ellesmere Port or Runcorn Docks should be accessible during the construction of the canal. Um, they commenced work on the eastern section and uh, Leader Williams specified that the 60 foot uh, rise to Manchester should be achieved with four paired locks after Eastham. That's Latchford, Earlham, Barton, and Mode Wheel. And the plants, that included a hundred steam excavators. Oh, and we'll meet the, the, the German navvies and the French navvies in a little while. And 173 locomotives. And 6,300 wagons. 
228 miles of temporary railway and 15,500 men and boys, or and 196 horses. You, you'll see one of those in a moment. But um, let's start our journey. On the way in, we visit Eastham by the Arrow, and then uh, Mount Manistee, and Ellesmere Port, and Runcorn. So let's go to the estuary just outside Eastham, they deepened the approach to the canal and a bank, which you can just visible in, in the background, um, kept the river at bay. And there is a pair of steam excavators at work. These excavators, is one of them, were, were these machines, they were capable of shifting 2,500 tonnes a day, rather more than a man with a barrow a spay, a shovel and a plank. And here they're dumping the spoil into horse-drawn trucks. I did promise you a horse, there he is. Um, Eastern locks are in the background there, we'll go over there now. Um, it gives you some idea of scale this, here's a man by the arrow. These gates are 36 feet tall, that's because they have to cater with the 14 foot tidal rise and fall of the, the Mersey, as well as the depth of the approach channel. Benjamin Williams Leader, RA. Mm. He was born Benjamin Leader Williams, but as he became well known as an artist, people started to confuse him with his already famous engineer brother, Edward. So he swapped his surname around. He made several paintings of the canal, and, and this is one of them. During the excavation works here at Frodsham, the spoil was dumped on Pool Hall rocks in the distance over there. Um, the workers then started to call this dump Mount Manistee. Why? Well, it was after the rather popular manager of this section of the canal, uh, Edward Manistee. Um, here's the mount again after the canal was opened. Uh, it's still there today, um, variously described as a, a striking feature with considerable elevation and also um, bleak and pockmarked with rabbit holes. Take your choice. Ellesmere Port. The lighthouse here at Ellesmere Port was built in 1802 to guide ships into the port from the Mersey. But the Mersey is now beyond that embankment which will form the edge of the canal. Five of the 13 miles between Eastham and Runcorn were built in this way. An embankment was created along the edge of the estuary and this became the bank of the canal. This one hasn't actually reached its full height yet because we can see um, uh, wagons depositing rock and soil. The contractors had a certain amount of fun in 1891, closing the gap in the embankment. That gap had been used for the craft, which was still accessing uh, Ellesmere Port. But the tide broke through. And the next day they tried again, this time with rocks and piles. That also failed. The gap was finally closed with layers of concrete in a 30 hour non-stop operation, ending on the 14th of July. The canal was flooded and the boat started using the canal two days later. Now work on the Runcorn section could start because Ellesmere Port was again available for use. I did mention the 228 miles of, well, very temporary railway, uh, which occasionally became so temporary that engines were derailed. I believe this was not an uncommon happening and a system using very long crowbars was developed to rectify the situation. This, I'd rather like this, it's rather an evocative photo. On the side of the hut here, there is a notice. It's about a special service in memory of Mr. Walker. Thomas Walker died on the 25th of November, 1889. He was only 62 years old, and this was his memorial service. His workers were, well, fiercely loyal to him. He was a good and fair boss. 
he actually set up three hospitals and first aid stations along the line of the canal. Um, and Walker continued to employ anyone in, injured in his service, if it was at all possible. And they were collectively called Walker's fragments. Here is one of his fragments. But much of the credit for the medical care should go to this man, Robert Jones, the surgeon superintendent. It was his idea to set up the hospitals and first aid posts, which were all connected with the dedicated railway to speed up the transport of injured men. It was he who invented the, the forerunner of today's triage system. Figures showed that during the six years of work on the canal, 130 men lost their lives. Uh, 165 were left with a permanent disability and just under a thousand were slightly injured. The entrepreneur early hotel owners gathered. Here, for instance, is an, a, a floating Hilton. A labourer was paid about a pound, that's a pound a week, spending 13 shillings on food and lodging. Again, to bring it up to date, multiplied by about a hundred. After Walker's death, there were delays due to bad weather and repeated flooding, which caused serious setbacks. But by early 1891, the canal company had run out of money and with only half the construction work completed, they were forced to seek financial help from the Manchester Corporation. This was in order to avoid bankruptcy. The required funds were approved and released by the corporation in March of that year in order to preserve the city's prestige. Thirteen thousand piles were sunk to stabilise the ten mile embankment built in the estuary between Runcorn and Eastham. The Runcorn Widnes railway bridge in the background was completed in 1869, so the canal had to thread its way through the gap between the abutment and the first pier by the Arrow. By 1893, Runcorn yacht docks were back in use. And this was as far as these vessels could go on the canal. Runcorn Railway Bridge stopped the passage of any craft in excess of 75 feet. Sailing ships transferred their cargo to barges here for onward transmission. This is a view over the gate of the bottom lock of the Runcorn branch of the Bridgewater Canal. The canal was initially built 26 feet deep and 120 feet wide at the bottom, although it narrowed at Runcorn to pass under the railway bridge. In 1909, the depth was increased to 28 feet, which it still is. Here's the other side of that, that railway bridge. This is a temporary dam here by the Arrow to carry the railway for trains dumping rock and soil on the new embankment. So from Runcorn, we move on to Latchford, to Caddis Head, to Earlham, and to Barton, and of course, to Salford Docks. The excavator called the French Navy, I promised I'd show you it, the French Navy was made by Boulet of Paris. The ship canal had four of these machines which dumped their spoil onto tr trucks which ran on tracks alongside. The German Navy, which was produced by a company in Lübeck, was larger and more stable than its French counterpart and as you can see the trucks for spoil here run through the middle of the machine. It's a lot more stable. At Latchford was the second railway crossing, but here the existing track was at ground level and had to be raised 75 feet onto a new viaduct, which was completed by the end of 1892. The railway owners weren't really confident that the viaduct was strong enough, and so they insisted that it be tested by running 10 locomotives out onto the bridge, which you can see is about to start. 
the engines will be left on the vac on the viaduct for a time and if successful i.e if the bridge didn't collapse um the railway company would then run goods trains on that track for six months only after that would the line be declared safe for passenger trains and finally in july 1893 the ground level track which is behind the photographer uh, could finally be taken up and the canal fully excavated and this was completed in october that year now this is at caddis head in may 1889 these barrel runs here shows that they were still using some of the older techniques of earth shifting, but with a rather more modern twist. The men are still pushing the barrows, but they are connected by a cable to a ca cable um, and being drawn up by a steam engine, which is just out of shot to the right. And in the foreground of this photo, there is just there an excavator creating a large hole. Hmm. I wonder if this is the, the one they dug for the dredger Bolin, because that craft was brought to the site in pieces and assembled in a hole. And then the hole was flooded and the floating dredger then proceeded to dig its way out. Here at Partington, the banks of the canal were softer and subject to erosion. And the company brought over some Dutch workmen who showed how to stabilise the bank using fascines, that's large clumps of willow branches pegged to the bank. When the water level was lowered in 1969 for maintenance work, those fascines were still as good as when they were put in place some 80 years before. And here's another barrow run. It connects the brick factory at Thelwell with the brick layers requiring the bricks at the top of the incline. It's on record that the factory produced 70 million bricks. And um, that, that incline really was more of a funicular railway. And oh, yes, by the way, that uh, viaduct in the background developed structural problems, was, was eventually demolished and replaced by an iron bridge similar to, to this one. Um, where you can see another Board of Trade test on Irwell Rail Bridge, that's running over the former course of the river. Earlham locks were completed in 1892. This photo is a bit earlier than that because the, the um, uh, construction work is still in course and the chambers are only half built. And um, because the ship canal was in parts a flowing river, sluices were necessary to control the flow of water. You can see one of the gates has been raised here to permit a temporary railway to be built through it. In January 1890, Manchester lived up to its reputation. A prolonged rain caused the Irwell and Mersey rivers to overflow and break down some dams, and this flooded the workings on the bottom of the canal. This rather literal part, literal pile up was a result of one of those floods. This was at Flixton. Some steam enthusiasts among you may like this image of one of the rail mounted steam cranes and its attendant railway side tipping truck. And if I enhance this to a rather moody level and visit the top right hand corner up there, um, you can make out the remains of the Mersey and Irwell's Stickings Lock. Do you remember? I asked you about it at the beginning. It was built in 1832 and you can see it here, complete with its lock cottage, both soon to disappear. Um, I can make the visit to the crane rather more intimate if I close in on the machinery where you can see the fireman by the arrow and the driver and um, does anyone know what this bloke does? Hmm, I don't know. Anyway, passing, uh, passing on, we've reached Barton Aqueduct, of course, built by Brindley in 1761 on the Duke of Bridgewater's Canal. Technically, it was three aqueducts crossing the, Earlham Ro the uh, Barton Road, and then the River Irwell, and then a footpath 
with someone riding a horse there. And in the foreground, a rather improbable road bridge. I'm not quite sure how they use that. It was artist license anyway, because this is what it actually looked like. Here's the original stone aqueduct, 38 feet above the Irwell, and it lasted 132 years until 1893. That's when the river became the Manchester Ship Canal. And they required, of course, a 75 foot air draft. Uh, by Act of Parliament, the Bridgewater Canal could not be closed or interrupted. So how to solve the problem? Well, Edward Leader Williams came up with the idea. But before we go to that, we've just come through the arch. We're looking at the upstream side of the Brindley Aqueduct. And um, rather, that, that strange road bridge is just beyond by the arrow. But in the foreground is the old Barton Lock, which was going to disappear. In fact, it's in the process of being dismantled as we watch. So anyway, let's go back to Leader Williams's idea. The work commenced in 1886. And here's the stone aqueduct and the pedestrian tunnel. And what they did was build brand two new tunnels underneath and diverted the River Irwell through them. And then they built the formwork for a new pier on the bed of the old river through the centre arch of Brindley's Aqueduct. And that pier is now uh, complete. And you can see they've commenced the construction of a large tank on a swivelling base on the far side. This is September 1891. By 1893, both the road bridge in the foreground and the tank in the background are complete. This is the still existing and uh, still used canal in Brindley's stone aqueduct, and it's just 20 feet away from the new tank. And straight ahead here is the new approach to that tank. And in May 1893, the water was admitted to this channel. Rather like this, but the channel collapsed. It was repaired by the 21st of August that year, and the first barges then used the new route. And at last, Brindley's aqueduct could be demolished. The tank could be swung for the first time to, to make sure it worked. And just uh, the tank is 235 feet long, it's 18 feet wide and six foot deep. And it weighs at 1,450 tons. This I'm sure is a publicity photograph because it shows a barge in the tank. And if you look up there, the horse on the elevated towpath. We'll come back here on our return journey, but for a moment, have a look at this summary. There's the Bridgewater Canal arrowed. There is the original course of the Bridgewater with the arrows pointing at where the old stone aqueduct used to be. There is the tank swung, tank, sorry, swung clear of the ship canal. There's the control tower, just make it out. There is the road viaduct. And there, to complete the picture, everything open to, for the passage of this cargo ship and its attendant tug. In these next four images, you can watch the channel being built. In the foreground here is the soon to be diverted River Irwell, with the proposed course of the canal stretching into the distance. Gradually, the channel is deepened. until it's ready for flooding. The Latchford section was the last to be flooded and the canal was filled end to end by the 25th of November, 1893. These are Salford docks and Pomona docks as they were originally planned. Pomona docks were the sort of the domestic docks dealing with a transfer into the inland waterway systems and local trans, local uh, companies. Please, by the way, remember the Manchester Racecourse. 
and this is where the new Trafford Swing Bridge will be built. And here it is in course of construction, Trafford Swing Bridge. It's still there today um, and it carries the Trafford Road over the new canal with the old river route to the right. We'll come back here in a little while. But for the moment, the full, first full passage of the ship canal was on the 7th of December, 1893. The official opening was three weeks later, on the 1st of January, 94, when the yacht Norseman, carrying the directors, led a procession of 71 ships past Barton Aqueduct. The first cargo ship in the, in the, in the procession was the Pioneer, rather aptly named, owned by the Cooperative Wholesale Society. And Queen Victoria formally opened the canal from the yacht Enchantress, on the 21st of May, 1894. Uh, then she knighted the mayors of Manchester and Salford. Edward Leader Williams and Boslin Leach, the company secretary, had to wait several more weeks before they received their knighthoods. Um, I, I like this card. They're, they're rather natty suiting, I think, for Queen Victoria's visit. You can see the celebrations in the background there. I wonder if they're singing the big ship sails on the alley alley -o. They say that song was written about the ship canal. It was soon realised that there weren't enough docks and Manchester Racecourse was bought and number nine dock over half a mile long was excavated through it. Um, that's behind this bank which kept the canal out of the workings. And the dock was filled gradually, and then the bank was finally destroyed with explosives, while a dredger waited to remove the last traces. The official opening, that was on July the 13th, 1905. Number nine dock in the background there. And this view is taken from the 168 feet high grain elevator, which they built in 1915 at the far end of the dock, or the near end where this one's taken. It was capable of storing 40,000 tonnes of grain. The docks had their own police force and fire brigade, which was set up in 1893. Um, the police force lasted 100 years until replaced by a security firm in 1993. This aerial shot shows docks six to nine um, with the grain elevator there at the end of number nine and over there the railway swing bridge which connected the dock railways in Trafford on the left with Salford on the right. Um, we've come now to Pomona docks, which handled, as I say, domestic cargo. And there is one of the ubiquitous little packets, as the Bridgewater steam tugs were called. Remember, no craft could exceed 75 feet in height. Here's a cargo ship with truncated masts and funnel being towed by one of the larger ship canal paddle driven tugs. Um, and which also actually moved the 250 ton floating crane around, crane there lifting a railway carriage. In the 1970s, containers and container ships revolutionized the way the docks were run. The docker's job virtually disappeared. In Manchester, they were handling up to 16 million tons a year, but by 1979, Manchester liners were finished the ships outmoded. And by December 1984, 3,000 docker jobs had disappeared and cargo handling had halved. Three years later, the company was bought by Peel Holdings. In 2013, Peel Ports handled 22,500 containers on the modernised canal, but Salford docks had virtually closed. Peel Ports predict that the number of containers transported along the canal could increase to 100,000 by 2030. 
in 1983, 1983, they tried to demolish that granary and they did succeed in making it lean over a bit. The railways closed in 1984, but um, some Hunslet engines survived. <laughs> I don't think any comment is necessary. As we come up to date, we move into colour. This is the Woden Street footbridge, which marks the meeting of the River Irwell in the foreground and the Ship Canal beyond. In 1994, the Big Ditch was 100 years old. Much of the domestic Pomona docks had become derelict and was filled in, except number three dock, where um, it's connected now to the Bridgewater Canal with this lock, replacing the Hume locks further up the canal. Do you remember this shot of Trafford Swing Bridge being built? Well, here it is today. Mm. Except uh, since this photograph was taken, they've added a new bridge in front of this one. You can see the top of the old bridge. Like this, um, if I backpedal a few yards, that sky hook comes into view. Lovely bit of sculpture. And uh, that rail, old rail bridge which carried the dock railways between Salford and Trafford Park, well, it isn't there anymore. It's there now across number nine dock and it's been sealed off from the canal number nine dock has. And the Mariners Canal was built then to link number eight and number nine docks. And also, of course, they built the Lowry Centre with a shopping mall and um, its art gallery dedicated to Lawrence Stephen Lowry, L.S. Lowry, who died in 1976. In 2002, they built this lifting pedestrian footbridge across the canal, giving access to the Imperial War Museum on the left. And the 2011 Media City footbridge, which swings out of the way of boats using the canal. So this is Salford Locks today. Um, let's take a quick tour of the bits which you've seen. Over there, Pomona Dock and Lock. And Trafford Bridges and the Skyhook. And the Railway Bridge originally. And where it is now. And the Mariners Canal linking numbers eight and nine. The Lowry Center, the Lifting Footbridge, the Imperial War Museum, and the Media City Swinging Footbridge. Oh yes, and this is where we are going to join the Mersey Ferry to set off on our 35 mile return voyage to Liverpool. This was a suspiciously bright day in 1994 as the Mersey Ferry Mountwood arrived from Liverpool on the Saturday afternoon, ready to take us on our journey the next day. But we needn't have worried because by Sunday, as we left, weather conditions had returned to normal. We've cruised the canal four times and every time it's been raining. So we drop down mode wheel lock and head off on our trip. We go under the Trafford lift bridge. This is the Arklow River, this uh, 3000 ton general cargo carrier, and she's a regular visitor to Manchester. This car scrappage scheme in 2009, it gave rise to this dock full of steel scrap waiting to be exported to Portugal. So we're approach, approaching Barton with the M60 Manchester Ring Road in the distance. They're just swinging the road bridge out of the way. To follow the sequence today, first the gate swings across the canal, followed by the gate sealing the lock, sealing the tank, sorry. 
This, of course, is also happening at the other end of the tank. And the tank gate is powered by what Jim here called mandrolics. <laughs> Up in the control tower, they put the power on. The motors start to whine. And slowly, the tank starts to move. Uh, clear of the bank and finally comes to rest along the central pier. Just to remind you that tank, 235 feet long, 18 foot wide, six foot deep, and weighing 1,450 tons. The road duct viaduct, by the way, weighs 800 tons. Um, and the boat comes through. Mm. Take a look, a closer look. Mm. Just by the bows of the ship there. After that ship had passed, we watched them jump into the canal. We come up to the control tower and the view eastwards towards Salford is this, with an Arklow ship there at that particular wharf. Do you remember this etching? Well, note the stonework of Brindley's aqueduct and compare it with this. Pretty accurate, I think. Up on top, of course, is the that where the grass is growing is the where the original Bridgewater Canal was. And finally, turning to look west towards that M60 rail um, ring road, which um, they've widened to carry yet more traffic, and they built a new lifting bridge across the canal. Uh, sorry, across the canal alongside the M60, which in 2016 the bridge deck collapsed. If you examine the picture, you can see what I mean. It was down like that, blocking the canal for three months until it was finally cleared away. <laughs> Talking of canal blockages <laughs> and what Martin said at the beginning. I thought you'd like to see this picture of the evergreen blocking the Suez Canal. Evergreen, ever living, ever given rather. Ever given was the name of the ship. Evergreen is the company. It's now been moved and I think it's been given the all clear to, to, to continue its voyage. Anyway, back to the Manchester Ship Canal. These are the Thelwell viaducts uh, carrying the M6 over the ship canal how often you sat in a motorway traffic jam there. I certainly have and I've watched cargo ships go by underneath me. They do say there's a ban on a breaking wash on the ship canal. Hmm. Orange green. Ah, oh, we've come to orange green. Yes, a superb photograph this with the, that paddle steamer making way and making smoke. Let's um, close in on that title a bit. Orange green. There isn't an orange green, but it is a great example of Chinese whispers or people not writing things down. It's actually Holland's green. Uh, this bridge has now become the Warburton High Level Toll Bridge. But we've arrived at Latchford, Latchford Lock, and we're dropping down now to the last level before Eastham. Latchford high level rail crossing where we first saw that first test with railway engines um, and these are two Mersey ferries doing just what we're doing at the moment taking a trip along the ship canal. Um, just in time the Northwich Road swing bridge opened to let us through. Um, Schoolboys and girls as well in Warrington had a regular excuse for being late at school. Hey sorry miss we was bridged. Back in 1998, we might have met this fleet of tugs and narrowboats heading for the um, Inland Canal and Wa uh, Waterways Association, sorry, Inland Waterways Association's uh, National Festival at Salford. Um, they were led, that procession was led by two MSC2, two Manchester Ship Canal tugs with, I think that's Chris Coburn's uh, progress 
in between them. Subject of tugs, um, here's the steam driven Daniel Adamson, the a memorial to the man who led the campaign for the ship canal. And the tug worked on the canal from 1922 to 1984 when she was laid up at Ellesmere Port. There, she gradually fell to bits and became a target for vandals. And Peel Holdings, rather than scrapping her, sold her for a pound to a recently formed restoration society. And they started work in 2004. And here is the Adamson on her way to her restoration at Liverpool Docks. And now fully restored and in steam, she can be seen around the waterways of the Northwest here on the River Weaver. Back on the ship canal, here's a shipload of Guinness and six road tankers. That comes to just over two million pints of Guinness. The, the Lady Patricia was a registered beer tanker with a capacity of 205,000 gallons. This postcard celebrates the official opening of the Runcorn Transporter Bridge on the 29th of May, 1905. And the first car crossing on the 8th of April. Oh, that was obviously before the official opening. Um, and um, here's that a postcard with what appears to be an early aeroplane. Is it genuine? I wonder, the Transporter Bridge at Widnes. Mm. Have a closer look. You decide. Is it painted in there? Is it, is it in, done in the photographic studio? I don't know. A little bit of research produced this picture of the 1910 Bristol box kite. There does seem to be quite a resemblance between the two. Thank you, Alamy, for letting me use that photo. But the railway bridge in the background opened in 1868. And the road bridge, which replaced the transporter bridge in 1961. However, the latest Runcorn crossing looks like this. It's about a mile and a half upstream and it opened on the 14th of October 2017. But returning for a moment to the Runcorn Bridge, um, I've got a little story to tell here. I was driving over the bridge and I saw a view I wanted to capture. And there was a convenient lay-by just there. So I pulled in and got out of the car. And then I heard, Nino, 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 Nino. Are you in trouble, sir? Uh, um, no, I just wanted, you are now, sir. This is an emergency lay-by. Back in the car and go. Well, I got back in the car and went but I did get the picture. There's the Harklow River again. And over on this side is one of the side locks, the old key lock, which was used as a shortcut to the Mersey here at Runcord. And behind that barge are some lock gates, old lock gates leaning up against the embankment wall. And indeed on the far side is the 250 tonne crane, still in existence, still used now primarily for lifting the lock gates when they need replacement or repair. This is the old entrance lock to the Bridgewater Canal, which rose through 10 locks here, eventually to its junction with the Trenton Mersey. Um, the house belonged to the Duke of Bridgewater, and it was built at the time of the building of the canal. But I think if he came back there now, he'd find the, the view somewhat obstructed. <laughs> Waterways World, we all know Waterways World, I think, sometimes includes little snippets of news like this item. It was in 2008, telling us that Eddie Stobart was setting up a base at Weston on the ship canal. And the fact that the boatmen followed the example of their road-based colleagues. They wore uniform shirts and ties. And so here is a motor and butty setting out to join the canal by that church in the background. All very plausible. 
perhaps I should tell you that this item appeared in the April edition. The building, by the way, is quite genuine. There it is. It's Christchurch, Western Point. It was built in 1841 for the River Weaver workers. And it's the only church on an uninhabited island in the whole of the UK. And if I widen the shot, you will see that fact followed fiction here. Eddie Stobart built a warehouse on the island in 2010. These are the Weaver sluices. The River Weaver flows in, into the canal on the right and needs somewhere to go, obviously. So it flows out again through the sluices. And um, let me just take you again around Runcorn. So there are the bridges at the top there. That's where the Bridgewater Canal entrance was. Here is where Eddie Stobart is. Here are the Weaver sluices. And this is where we, we are now. Let's go there. A view to the Mersey. Over millions of rabbit homes, I promise you. Past uh, Stanlow Oil Port. It was built in 1947 when it was the largest inland oil terminal after London. And small tankers still unload there. So passing Ellesmere Port, the entrance to the Shropshire Union Canal. Um, if you remember, we saw the dock empty way back at the start of our journey. The lighthouse here built in 1802 to guide ships in from the River Mersey. I don't know why I like this photo. Perhaps I think because it reminds me of the War of the Worlds. I don't know. Anyway, these cranes, I'm afraid, have been dismantled. As indeed has this one. It was the dismasting and disfunneling crane at Eastham. Let me show you. If ships arrived with masts or funnels over 75 foot high, this crane would remove the offending bits and replace them with shorter versions. And when the lift ships left the port, they stopped here and asked for their bits back. So we've jumped on now to the three Eastham locks, which were, I suppose, the first things we saw being built. 600 feet long, 350 feet and 150 feet. And the much larger Eastham oil port, which could cater for tankers up to 800 feet long. Now even this dock is too small and larger vessels moor up at an offshore terminal at Tranmere. There we are. There's the Nevi and Oslo at Tranmere having finished delivering her cargo. So we leave the Manchester Ship Canal. Our circle is essentially complete. But um, should we cross to Liverpool and uh, finish our Mersey ferry journey? We land here to arrive in the city of Liverpool. We transfer to coaches and we're driven back to Salford where we started. Mm, let's say here, just for a little while in Liverpool, it's the city with the three graces, the Royal Liber building, the Cunard building and the Port of Liverpool building. And two cathedrals the city with a cathedral to spare, both of them built in the 20th century. To return for a moment to the quayside, here's the liver birds looking down on the 1.5 mile, 1.4 mile, um, brand new Liverpool Canal link, which connects the Leeds and Live Canal to the city's south docks and thence to the Mersey. It cost 22 million pounds and it was opened in March 2009. I wonder if any of you have cruised it. And here's the liver birds up there on the Royal Liver Building, or a little closer, just one of them. They're 18 foot tall, they have a 12 foot wingspan, and they're thought to represent a cormorant. The rather imposing bulk of the Anglican Cathedral 
started in 1904 and completed 78 years later. It was designed by Giles Gilbert Scott, who was the architect who was also responsible for the Battersea Power Station and the red telephone box. And um, did you know that inside the Anglican Cathedral, there is room for Nelson's column at the crossing? Provided he takes off his hat. And the affectionately nicknamed Paddy's Wigwam, the Metropolitan or Catholic Cathedral, started in 1962 and completed in five years. It was designed by Sir Frederick Gibbard, who was also responsible for um, Harlow Newtown in Essex. With that stunning lantern. And that swathe of colour. I think that's enough. You'll have to book a passage on a Mersey ferry if you want any more. Because I'm going to leave you in a traffic jam on the M60 above the Manchester Ship Canal. Thank you so much.